Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kim Coble. I'm the Executive Director for the Maryland League of Conservation Voters, and welcome to Friday Digest. I'm really happy today to be talking about a very important issue for the state on offshore wind. And uh, we have uh, Chuck Cook of the Business Network for Offshore Wind joining us, and Delegate Lori Charcutian from District 20 will be here as soon as she gets off the uh, House floor. We knew that might be a conflict, but we're, uh, we'll adjust to her schedule. We're very honored to have her as a bill sponsor here. Before we jump in, a few housekeeping pieces. Um, first of all, our goal here is to help you become engaged, informed, inspired advocates on the issues that matter most around the environment in Maryland. So keep us posted on what you wanna hear, what we can discuss. There's a survey at the end we hope you will complete and um, look forward to getting your feedback on that. Also, if you don't mind, put your name and where you're from in the chat so we can track who's here and um, how we're doing. And um, if you have questions uh, or hear things that you want to ask Chuck or um, Delegate Charcuti, and go ahead and put them in the question and answer, and we'll try to get to them at the end here. So um, enough of that preamble. This year, there is a bill called the POWER Act, and it is that is an acronym that stands for Promoting Offshore Wind Energy Resources Act. And uh, this is the offshore wind bill, um, if, if you aren't using the acronym. So let me have uh, Chuck introduce himself and he has a couple slides to share and give you a little background on business network and as well as the issues. So Chuck, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Kim, I appreciate it. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and we'll start this presentation and go through some information with you guys. Um, so I'm going to do a bit of an industry overview. It's going to cover a little bit of where we are um, with industry and with workforce. Um, so let's give you a little more information about us. We are the business network for offshore wind. We were founded in Maryland in 2013 upon the passage of the original offshore wind bill that was done. We have about 100 members now. Um, uh, everything from the unions to the large developers and tier one, tier two, and tier three manufacturers and construction companies. And the entire reason we exist is to build the U.S. offshore domestic wind industry supply chain. We are a non-for-profit uh, membership based. All of our members uh, pay in for the business network and we provide information, education, and interactions. Um, so we kind of are a bit of the connective tissue to kind of keep the entire offshore wind supply chain together and moving forward in the U.S. So let's look at some uh, some numbers, right? Our global demand, uh, 56 gigawatts total are operating. Um, there are 630 gigawatts by 2015 that are in the pipe. Um, we have a floating market of 15 gigawatts by 2035 is our U.S. goal as laid out by President Biden. We only have 123 megawatts operating. It's a brand new technology. Our finances is there's a lot of money coming into this to build it. Um, so you have 16.6 .6 billion European projects and 2.2 billion United States uh, investments right now. In our US market, we have about 77 gigawatts of demand. Again, the president has 30 gigawatts by 2030 as a US goal. As a US goal. Uh, and we have 17.6 under contract, with only 42 megawatts operating. Um, it's been a slow build to get where we are. And now we're expecting to see a huge ramp up vineyard wind in the Northeast coming online this summer. So let's look at what our offshore wind market looks like. Um, this is a good map just to get you to visualize where all of the, the areas are that are currently under uh, construction, siting and permitting, or leasing stages. If you'll notice uh, number 15 and 16 are the ones that apply to us in Maryland with uh, the two Orsted project and Skipjack 1 and 2 and U.S. Winds projects, Marwind and Momentum Wind. So we won't linger on this, but I just wanted to see this is where almost all of the activity in the United States is happening right now is in the Northeast. It's where it started. It's where it's continuing to build. Uh, we just had a lease sale out in California. You'll see on the far left-hand side of the map in areas 21 and 22. And there will be a lease sale this summer in areas of 27 in the Gulf Coast. So we're starting to become tri-coastal in the market. Let's look at 
kind of the components wind projects so you guys have a good idea what we're working with here um and all of these take massive amounts of people to actually construct and thousands of companies in the supply chain um, to get done uh, so you've got everything from your foundations and substructures to your inner array cables the actual generator itself uh, wind is 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 interesting in that you need an offshore substation to collect the power from the farm and send it to an onshore substation to put it back onto the grid. So everything from land work all the way out to deep sea work, uh, and you'll see at the far end there, we have an example of a floating turbine, the newest technology that will be uh, deployed on the west coast. So you see there is a lot that goes into these things, and the size of these are, are massive. You'll see in some pictures I have there. Talk about Maryland right now. We uh, awarded out the OREX in 2017 and 2021, uh, looking at an overall ratepayer impact of $2.28 a month for about 600,000 homes of clean energy once our four projects are found and operating. We have, uh, it re requires local content, right? It was in the legislation, it's been in uh, negotiated agreements using Baltimore area Ocean City port facilities. Uh, the investiture at $76 million in the steel fabrication plant in Federalsburg, $39 million in port upgrades at Trade Point Atlantic, which are starting this June. They'll start rebuilding up the Trade Point Atlantic, um, Sparrows Point. $450 million in tower monopile and array cable facilities, around 750 jobs. And it has to create a combined 15,321 jobs. Anybody that knows me from my previous job working Maryland State and DC AFS CIO. I am very passionate about the job creation and more importantly, family sustaining career creation uh, in offshore wind. It has significant in state spending and women, minority, and veteran owned uh, business targets that have to be hit in order to bring more, more folks into the process. So let's look at our US wind lease area. These are the two projects uh, Mar Wind and Momentum Wind coming in at about a gigawatt. All together, said and done, about 77 turbines, and the uh, construction will start in this area in 2026. Uh, and with that came the creation of the Sparrows Point Steel. Um, for anyone on here that remembers Sparrow Point, Sparrows Point, and uh, uh, you know Bethlehem Steel, there. It's been about 20 years since steel workers have come back to Sparrows Point, and they are coming back to the tune of 300 to start at a steel fabrications facility. Um, organized by our brothers and sisters at U, uh, USW. Steel fabrication facility upgrades and more upgrades at Trade Point are required with this lease area. We look at the uh, Orsted lease area. <clears throat> Again, it's about a gigawatt. It's going to have 72 turbines total operating between the two projects. And they're bringing in an array cable and tower construction facility upgrades at the East for fabrication and supporting creation of platform vessel operators, <laughs> as well as <clears throat> the 25 million for steel fabrication, 13 million for upgrades of trade. All right, moving on, local opportunities by phase and year. On the existing projects, this is kind of how it goes. These are the five phases of wind, right? Siting and permitting, that's been going on. That's a uh, federal and state operation with the developers to figure out their siting and permitting. Manufacturing is me medium or tier two businesses. 2425 construction and installation medium tier two it's a 2026 timeline for the projects and then you have operations and maintenance that are permanent workers that work out the remainder of the projects not listed here is all the onshore work so building the manufacturing facilities to service them building the marshalling facilities to service them. those are on different timelines and predate some of these in order to get ready for it look a little bit of our workforce demands 81 percent is manufacturing and supply chain. It takes a lot to service the building of these. And that's really where a lot of this work is going to be coming from in the, not just for these two projects, but because Trade Point Atlantic is operating as a hub to service other projects, that manufacturing and supply chain is gonna be incredibly important in Maryland to continue servicing offshore wind farms as they can. Okay. This is a picture of what Happens in a monopile facility. This is this is kind of the the size of these steel um, monopiles that are being put in the ground at a uh, fabrication facility. When they're completed, generally this is the size when they're shipped out and they start being pounded into the ground. So I wanted to give you a size 
a kind of an idea of scale here and what we're looking at when it comes to building these uh, these gargantuan uh, towers out there. Okay. Let's talk about job skills. What's required? Let's go back. Monopile tower, factory skill sets. We need welders, iron workers, steel fabricators, um, quality uh, assurance, quality control inspectors, forklift operators, electricians. These are this is just in the monopile tower factory skill sets. This is on land um, prior to the actual build itself with the requirements. Part of that 81% we talked about. And these supplier welders require a bunch of certifications, right? These are incredibly highly skilled jobs, take years of training to get to, um, and, and pay incredibly well. And, you know, like I said, I'm all about family creating, you know, family sustaining jobs um, <clears throat> and careers. And that's where we're looking at with construction these projects. We see cable manufacturing requires, you know, all of, the, all of these listed here. We can't get the power to, to the shore. We can't get it to the onshore or offshore substation. It doesn't matter. So we're going to need cabling operations. And the thing about that, again, is part of our contract here in Maryland is to bring a cabling uh, manufacturer to create one Atlantic Health Service. Yeah. Not to mention onshore marshalling and free assembly. Both U.S. Wind and Orsted have, will have marshalling facilities at Trade Point Atlantic, where they will load up what needs to be loaded up, bring in the, uh, um, the monopile steel from the factory that will be in there, bring the cabling from the factory in there, marshal it all, send it down the bay and then out to the service areas for the floor project. Again, lots of jobs needed, highly skilled labor that's gonna be needed. And then I love this picture because it gives you a true idea of the true scale of these things once they're built. Once it's done, operations and maintenance um, to 20, 30, 40 year lifespan out as they um, work these things, these are, you can work as an operations and maintenance crew member for the entirety of your career in that in that service. You have your marine crew, you have your trained wind technicians, you have foundation support maintenance, marine services, operations engineer. Um, so this is more than a notion to get these things set up and and, and operation and maintenance is, is again, um, going out decades, um, allowing people to work <laughs> on these facilities for the lifetime of and then the last piece I wanted to talk about real quick, too, is GWO certification. So in this particular field, um, because it is European based and was started over there um, in uh, Denmark, uh, the UK and Germany, they have developed a global wind um, organization certification. So on top of all the training that our folks get to do this job, they also have to be certified uh, with the GWO certification in order to work on these facilities, up to and including those on the docks that are working in hydraulic, electrical, mechanical. Work. So throughout the entire supply chain, they're gonna require this level of BWO certification um, once they're working from the marshaling facility. It's incredibly important to remember that on top of all the training, they have to receive additional training to get ready to actually. Right? Chuck, thank you. That uh, yep. very helpful to see the overview and clearly, Absolutely. The offshore wind industry creates lots of jobs uh, and um, and highly skilled jobs, both on land, on water, um, in all sorts of fields. So that's fabulous. It also is a renewable source of energy without any carbon emissions. So clearly, this is an industry that we want to build in yep. Maryland. I'd like to turn to Delegate Charcuti and, and thank her for, I know, it's a very busy day for you, and we really appreciate you taking the time. Um, as I mentioned earlier, she's from District 20 and the lead sponsor of the Power Act. So Delegate Charcutian, complicated bill, but really a simple message that's being um, conveyed through this bill. Can you talk to us a little bit about what's in it? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for inviting me to join. And um, sorry to be a little late getting on. I just just step off the house floor. Things are rocking and rolling in Annapolis right now. Um, and I'm really excited because the Power Act is going to be heard on Monday in the House and on Tuesday in the Senate. And hopefully we start moving it after that. Thanks to Maryland LCV for your extraordinary support of this bill and offshore wind for years and years and years. Um, as everyone knows, probably knows, um, offshore wind, if you saw it, just the size. I love those photos, Chuck. Thanks for putting those out there so we could like wrap our heads around, um, you know, what we're building. Um, 
And to, to Kim's point, um, the extraordinary power of offshore wind is part of our uh, getting to 100% clean energy mix um, because of its capacity and because of the fact that it um, has that high capacity factor and the wind blows in the ocean when the sun's not shining on the shore. So like just so important for so many reasons. Um, so what this bill does, what the Power Act does this year is it basically lays, sets the table it lays out everything that we are going to need to be able to put into place um, 8.5 gigawatts by 2031. And so it sets that goal, which is very important. But more importantly, it builds out and establishes the system that we're going to use to have a unified, coordinated transmission plan. And it lets us experiment with a new way of procuring offshore wind without the burden being on ratepayers. So we set the we set the goal, 8.5 gigawatts by 2031. Um, folks probably know uh, it's gotten a lot of attention recently that transmission is the biggest barrier to bringing new renewables online across this country. It's worse than PJM, which is the grid that we're in, but across the country, it's the challenge. The solution is what New Jersey did, which was to coordinate a state planned transmission solution for offshore wind. It's more efficient. Um, it costs less in the long term, and it supports offshore wind developers to be able to essentially focus on developing the offshore wind and not have to try to be negotiating with PJM and figure out the transmission solution. So it's a huge step forward to be able to do offshore wind um, in the next several years. And then the last piece is um, we do have space left in our current wind lease areas that we could build out in the next five or so years. And there's a procurement model that is built into this Power Act so that we can experiment with a new way of doing um, procurement of offshore wind that we hope will be able to be used in the future um, that doesn't put the burden on ratepayers and will let us build out and use the space that's currently in, in place. Because really we have, you know, we can't be wasting offshore wind space when we're facing the climate crisis that we're facing right now. So that's the big picture. As uh, you all know, I'm happy to talk about the details of the picture if, if anyone has additional questions. Uh, you're on mute, Kim. Thank you. We actually got a good question from um, one of our audience here. And uh, let me go ahead and read it. Um, New York Times recently had an article on the big challenges facing um, when we hook up with new solar, new wind projects and the, the burden on the grid, both due to grid limitations and because regional grids are overwhelmed um, from these applications. So as these renewables grow, we have a limitation on the grids. Can you just go through what this bill does to address that point? Yeah, sure. So uh, we're in the PJM region and the problem in the in you know all the grids as we've said and and but I think that the New York Times article if it's the one I'm thinking of names PJM specifically as one of the most challenged ones, um, and uh, basically the grid and all the rules of how to interconnect to the grid have been built for large fossil fuel generators um, connecting into the grid. And the problem is that the powers that be at PJM still are primarily large fossil fuel generators and the companies that support that model. And so um, the reality is they have slow walked all of the transitions that are necessary to really get renewables on as quickly as possible. Um, so I won't go into a lot of details on the bigger picture, but we do need to address that over time, the, the PJM slow walking of all renewables. What this bill does is it directs the PSC, and this is very important, PJM plays a really key role and will have to play a really key role in, um, in this procurement of this unified offshore wind transmission plan that we have envisioned in this bill. But if we don't direct the PSC to work hand in hand with them and really to walk them through that process, we cannot be sure that PJM will do what is necessary in Maryland to have that transmission built. And so what this bill does is it really directs the PSC to walk that path with PJM. So while we need PJM to do a lot of it, they're not going to do it unless we direct it in state law and direct PSC to do that with them. And that's what this bill, that's what this bill sets up. And if you read the Times article, you can see why we can't just leave it up to PJM. We really need our PSC driving that train. Good point. 
Chuck, talk to me a little bit about you're a member organization, right? And you have members internationally. Um, so tell us uh, how your members are feeling about this bill and the actions taking place in Maryland. Well, they're supportive. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, we have, we started out in 2013 with a, a bold goal at the time among states on the East Coast and have since been eclipsed by almost every except for three, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Maine. Um, so right now, Virginia uh, has a higher goal than us at five. Uh, New Jersey has a higher goal than us at 7.5 with pending legislation to nearly double that. New York is uh, going to increase theirs, Massachusetts as well. And that'll put us solidly at the bottom of the pack, which means that it makes us a less competitive state when developers and manufacturers and suppliers are looking to locate uh, if they don't feel that the state is as supported as they could they could go to New Jersey. New Jersey seems to be uh, pushing really hard for it. So you know what we want to we want to be there. Uh, we go to New York, right? So for instance, we have three blade manufacturers domestically in the United States: GE, Siemens Gamesa, and Vestas. Well, Siemens Gamesa has announced a facility to, to build blades in Virginia. Um, GE is announcing to build blades in Albany at a, at a facility. Uh, if they get all the contracts they want for wind out in uh, what's, what's called the New York Bight, which leaves Vestas looking for a place to locate. Well, we have Trade Point Atlantic. We have two marshaling facilities. We have a monopile construction facility. Wouldn't it be great to bring in the hundreds and hundreds of workers it would take for the blade manufacturing facility to help us service? So our our members are are absolutely you know supportive of everything that's in this bill, specifically to drive the industry. We need we need the mechanism like this to provide certainty and constancy um, so that investors and manufacturers and developers want to use Maryland uh, and build in Maryland and work to build the wind farm in the future. Absolutely. Yeah, the, I think that um, to emphasize this point, there's a real need for Maryland as a state to, to come out strong saying, this is an industry we want here. We want it because it's good for the environment, it's good for jobs, it's good for the economy, right? So Lori, how important, this is a question we've gotten from um, some members here. How important is it to show that there's a consumer demand for offshore wind? Well, um, I think that I think that it's important to show that there's a consumer demand, a constituent demand for a future on this planet. I mean, I, I think that well, it gets very clear that if we don't put in offshore wind, um, we are not like we have no shot at reaching our climate goals. The country has no shot at reaching its climate goals. The planet has no shot at a future. And so, um, you know, it's my sense that my constituents, um, you know, love offshore wind, but love offshore wind because it gives us a shot at this planet. So like, it doesn't matter which, you know, which clean energy is like, we just, we've got to do this. Um, I think the other thing that there's a consumer demand for is um, a good, strong economy, a strong economy with union jobs. And I think what is really fantastic about the offshore wind industry is we like we're at this precipice point. We can make big decisions this year that will get us all the things we value, right? That will get us the clean energy, that will get us the union jobs, that will get us manufacturing in the state, that will get us um, MBE and women-owned businesses, like all the things we value about both the planet and the kind of economy we believe in. And it's make or break, because if we don't get ourselves on the right path, to Chuck's point, um, at, like you know, we could really lose out, you know, it'll happen in other states, but Maryland could lose out on, on being a leader and Maryland could lose out on those economic opportunities. Excellent point. And uh, Becky, I apologize. Can we get a definition of PJM and PSC? Those are acronyms that we haven't defined earlier in the session. So sure. Lori, 
Yes, the Public Service Commission is the Maryland body that oversees and regulates utilities and a lot of energy-based decision-making in the state sort of falls under them. Um, and the PJM is, it actually is PJM, It's but it's, it stands for, uh, uh, what's the P? Uh, the M is Maryland and Jersey is the J and P is Pennsylvania. Um, but it is just called PJM because it's 13 states. It started as those three and now it's 13. So they, they, this PJM interconnections, I think LLC is the official title and they're the, the regional transmission organization, um, that manages the grid for the 13 states. So, um, real quickly, we're getting lots of questions, but, uh, real quickly, Chuck, um, Environmental concerns around offshore wind, you know, wildlife, we've been reading a lot about whales and birds and sea life. Um, what, uh, talk to us a little bit about those concerns and if those are being addressed at all or need to be addressed around um, legislation on offshore wind. Sure, so um, when it comes to uh, environmental impact studies, you know, anything we need to do to protect the environment, the entire process is done federally on that level. So between the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, the reason why it takes so long to actually build out a wind farm, right? So we passed a law in 2013, there's bidding, everything going out, the first things dropping in the water in 26, 13 years later, is because there is an enormous amount of um, uh, energy put in on the federal level on siting and permanent environmental impact in the lease area where you're going to be putting this thing down. So uh, they are very cognizant of it. The, the companies are very cognizant of it. I mean, we're talking about primarily in Maryland, European developers that had to go through the process of the European Union and their waters too. So this is part of their business model to, to you know, mitigate environmental issues. Um, and to be as environmentally conscious as possible when we're, when we're putting this monopile on the ground and where to play. It. So to have the least amount of impact as possible. So it's, it's not necessarily dealt with directly in this bill because there is a federal umbrella that covers that piece that they're not allowed to make a move on until they pass all of the permitting through the Bowman. Great. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's thoroughly vetted and... Um... Uh, yes. Um, can, can I jump in on that? And, yeah. uh, um, and, and let me just, uh, there's another question about whether or not an EIS is required. So go ahead, Lori. Um, Environmental you, impact statement. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know, Chuck, you're saying yes. I, I just was going to add that in addition to all the federal protections, we do have an amendment that we've been working on with some of the wildlife protection organizations oh. that um, requires many of those things to be filed with the state as well. So should we ever reach a point where the federal government changes those rules, those same things would still be in state law. So we're, we'll mirror that. Excellent point. We've got just another minute. Um, so uh, this could be a long <laughs> question, but um, somebody's asking, Lorig, if there's, uh, can we use a power purchase agreements for onshore Solars, uh, storage, et cetera, um, as a solution to the PJM. Um, I'm issue. not sure if I, so. This bill uses a power purchase agreement to do the 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 purchasing, as I mentioned, of the remaining um, the remaining lease areas. Okay. I don't know if the question about doing power purchase agreements for solar storage as a solution to PJM is asking, like, would that solve the interconnection problem? Um, if that's the question, the answer is no, because the interconnection problem is regardless of whether you have a a committed off taker or you're trying to sell it in the market with with Rex and and the wholesale market. So um, thanks for the like, but let's keep doing creative thinking on how to solve the the PJM mess. Yeah. So um, we are out of time. Boy, uh, this is a complicated issue, but I think both Chuck and Delegate Charcuting have laid out a great argument to engage. Um, in our chat, there's a an ability to uh, send an action alert and let your legislator know that you care about this issue and it's important to you. So please take a look at that, um, track the bill, stay in touch with us, um, and let me express our deep gratitude to Delegate Charcutian for her leadership on this, which has been phenomenal. And also Chuck for lending in such important industry input into it. Um, 
it is the future and it's coming. So let's do it right. So thank you all. Thank Next you. week, we're talking about um, community solar and uh, what's moving on with that renewable energy source. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. In the meantime, have a great weekend and thanks for joining us. Bye now.